Okay, welcome to the July 18th edition of the Fats, Fuels, and Oils webinar. This week, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what's going on with the weather, and then we're going to talk about uh, our expectations for the upcoming EMTS data uh, that the EPA should release on Thursday, which will contain uh, biofuel production estimates for June. Um, okay, so let's dive right in. Uh, we've talked a bit about sort of the pattern this summer and how it's drier. I had an old meteorologist that used to believe there were potential changes in weather patterns around the, uh, the summer solstice. And uh, in for a minute, that kind of looked like that might actually hold. Um, however, over the last week or so, the forecast maps have trended drier and, and hotter. Now, most of the rainfall in the, in the really hot temperatures are near the end of the forecast period. So it's not 100% clear yet, I don't think, that uh, that they're actually going to verify. That said, the average temperature, the average high temperature for the Corn Belt is projected to be well into the 90s uh, near the end of the forecast period. And not so important for soybeans, but really important for corn, although less so with each passing day. Overnight temperatures are expected to be above 70 degrees, which makes it tough for essentially the corn plants to breathe uh, overnight while they're in pollination, which can hurt pollination, but that's a different webinar. Uh, for soybeans, the main concern, of course, would be the amount of rain that falls. And uh, you can see from the, the map that we're showing, a significant portion of the, of the soybean growing area is still considered to be in drought. Now, timely rainfall, has, has helped, uh, and we'll show that in just a second when we start to talk about crop condition ratings. But the key will be whether uh, the forecast rainfall that you see in the chart here actually verifies. Now, none of that is really heavy rain. If you remember your uh, imperial to metric conversions, it takes about 25, um, 25 millimeters, and I, th I think the the uh, the chart is wrong. I, th I think that's millimeters and not inches. And so it takes about 25 millimeters of rainfall to make an inch of rainfall. So if that's about 2.5 millimeters a day, that's about a tenth of an inch a day, which is not really sufficient to continue to support additional improvements in, in crop condition ratings, especially if, if daytime highs are gonna be in the mid 90s or, or upper 90s, um, as the forecast suggests that they will. All of that said, uh, if you look at how USDA judged the condition of the crop up to last week, you can see that we've really uh, started, we've really bottomed and started to come back and now we're even in the five-year range. Um, and so there's no doubt that the crop has benefited from the recent rainfall. But of course, with soybeans, a key question is how much is it going to rain in, in September, uh, late August and September? And um, it looked like that perhaps the pattern had changed and we were kind of out of the, the concerns about not enough rainfall. Um, if the weather forecast verifies and we do enter this period of, of hot temperatures near the end of July, uh, then I think that, again, as, as long as the crop gets timely rainfall, it will probably be okay. If, if we get hot temperatures, if we get 95 degree temperatures and we don't really get much rainfall, in the last week of July, and then even in the first couple of weeks of August, I think you will probably start to see the market, and today the market's up a little bit, but I think you'll probably start to see the market price in a, a cut in yields. Now, uh, 
we're using a trend line yield of 52.5. Uh, USDA is using 52. And USDA didn't change their, um, their yield forecast in the June WASD report, which is what typically happens. However, they did change their, uh, their corn forecast, their corn yield forecast, based on weather conditions so far. Typically, they don't change their yield forecasts in the July report. Typically, the August report is the first report that has subjective yields or, or yields other than the trend line, except for years when uh, weather conditions have been so obviously poor or so obviously good, it's much more poor than good, um, that yields are probably not going to make it to USDA's assumed trend line yield. Um, so the fact that they didn't change soybeans and they changed corn reflects a little bit about how the, the two crops develop relative to each other. And the fact that the, the really important part of, of development for soybeans comes later than it does for corn. And corn is kind of going through its most important part now. And what I meant before when I said sort of the temperature part is less important every day is as it goes through pollination, of course, it still doesn't want really hot temperatures and it still wants to be able to sort of breathe overnight. Um, but it's most critical that the crop gets through pollination. All right, again, that's a different webinar. Uh, for soybeans, basically, as long as the plants survive into the period where rain is, is critical, and we've talked a lot about this in the past, um, if you stress the crop a little bit and then pour a bunch of rain on it, essentially what happens is you can get really good yields because in really simple terms, what the stress does is it tells the crop not to, or it tells the plant not to spend a bunch of energy on, on building a big canopy and really tall plants with a bunch of leaves and a bunch of, um, a bunch of uh, branches because it's, essentially says, oh, I've got to survive. And so I'm going to put all my energy into passing my genetic material on, which is in the soybeans themselves. And so you can have a, a crop that doesn't look that great. And if it gets rain at the exact right time, it can yield really, really well. Conversely, you can have a crop that looks fantastic. And if it doesn't get uh, rainfall, then your yields will, uh, will decline. And so I think that over the next month and a half or so, soybean prices are probably going to be one of the main drivers for soybean oil prices. Of course, demand and supply, the NOPA crush came in a little bit lighter than expected uh, on Monday or Friday maybe. Um, and so that supply, those concerns about supply uh, because of the crop will help support prices. But I think if you sort of just want to know, you know, where are soybean oil prices going to be in six weeks? My first question would sort of be, where do you expect soybean prices to be? Because I think that is at least how the market is, is set up right now, that soybean oil is, is very much a function of what's going on in soybeans, and, and they are very much a function of uh, what's going on with the weather and, and what does the crop look like. Um, on the NOPA crush, uh, I'll just talk about that really quickly. We don't really have any charts for it, but it came in a little bit light. If you look at what that implied for ending stocks or for uh, domestic demand in, in non-biofuel, domestic, domestic non-biofuel demand, nothing was really striking about the report. The, the crush came in a little bit lower than expected, like I said, um, but that didn't translate into sort of a huge reduction in, in soybean oil production, in part because uh, NOPA said the yield was so high. I think they said the yield was, the average yield was 11.93 or 11.97 pounds per uh, bushel of, of soybeans crushed. And that additional yield then helped offset some of the difference between where NOPA came in and, and our expectation. And our expectation was about a million or a million and a half bushels larger than NOPA reported. So 
we weren't off by that much uh, to begin with. And then the higher than expected yield kind of helped offset that. So in terms of the impact of the report on our expectations for supply and demand in, in, uh, in June, it didn't really make significant differences. I think non the implied non-biofuel demand was about 1.1 billion pounds. That could even be a little bit stronger depending on what biofuel demand actually does. We have an assumption in here that we'll go through in a minute um, that might be a little bit high. And so if, if that's actually the case, then what would happen is as that data comes in and we understand that the feedstock demand was lower than expected, it would just boost the domestic non-biofuel demand which again is already around 1.1 billion pounds or something uh, in June based on, on the NOPA data. So not any huge surprises or, or big developments, I think, from the, uh, from the NOPA report, which again kind of is why I say that I think the, the vast majority of the the day-to-day -day fluctuations in soybean oil prices over the next little while will mostly be determined by what's going on with the soybean crop. Of course, if we get some development or in, and uh, the EPA did something that changed uh, the mandates or something, that would be a different story. There's always stuff like that that can happen. Uh, we don't expect anything. But um, unless something like that happens, we think that soybeans probably are going to remain the primary driver for, uh, for prices going forward. The one other thing that I'll, that I'll kind of say, and then I'll go through the rest of the weather slides and wrap this part up, uh, is that the other thing that potentially could have an impact, although I, I think that the market has probably largely priced this in, uh, was the expiration of Ukraine, the, the grain corridor agreement between Ukraine and Russia. We prices took off uh, when, the, when, the deal or when the deal expired. And that kind of makes sense. I think a, a lot of what has happened, and in, in if you look back, um, the Ukrainian government did a, a nice job of providing information about the different modes of transportation for grain, oilseed, and oilseed product exports out of Ukraine around the, around the war. They probably had the information there the whole time, but I only looked at it sort of after the war started. And what you saw was a shift from exporting seed or oil or meal out of the ports and to mainly exporting seed into uh, Poland and, and other areas in Eastern Europe. So much so, I think that actually the European Union um, did something so that, uh, that the flow of, of rapeseed out of the Ukraine wouldn't necessarily go to Poland. I think it could go to other EU countries. It was, I didn't quite understand what they were trying to do. But the bottom line is, I think that uh, for rapeseed or the oilseed markets in general, I think they made a lot of that adjustment once the war started. And so I don't necessarily think that the expiration of the, of the grain corridor will have a significant impact on prices. That said, uh, it does reduce the potential amount, or it, it reduces the avenues that I guess that Ukraine can export. And given that there is a, a limit logistically on, on the volume of grain that they can export, it may have some impact, modest impact on, um, on the amount, the amount of rapeseed that they export and then uh, ultimately on the supply of, of rapeseed oil that's produced from that seed. Again, I think the other thing that probably, probably mitigated to a, a degree the announcement of the expiration of the grain corridor uh, is the fact that a lot of the prime agricultural land in, in Ukraine is kind of in Eastern Ukraine and, and relatively close to where there's been some fighting. So 
there just have been several things for the market to price in since the start of the war. And this one to me, although it's, I think it's important for wheat because I think they still ship a significant amount of, or a substantial amount of, of wheat out of the port. Um, for me, I think that the, the oilseed market kind of already dealt with this and the Ukrainian industry kind of already dealt with this. So I think it'll be just impact on the margin the amount of rapeseed and rapeseed oil that flows out of, out of Ukraine. Here's the uh, latest outlook for, um, for July. And you can see this was uh, produced at the end of June. And that was before we really started to get the idea of uh, that there was going to be a ridge in the middle of the country by the end of the month. I imagine the next time that they come out with one of these for August, it, it will look a little bit different. Uh, and it probably will have some rainfall restricted. I think if you think about where the rain has fallen so far in July, the precip outlook probably was, was pretty good. The storm track for a lot of the month has kind of taken storms through Southern Iowa, uh, Central Illinois, and then up uh, through the Eastern Corn Belt, kind of up through Michigan. Uh, the other part of, of the July temperature outlook or the July outlook that might be a bit off going forward is the, uh, is the temperature forecast where we're going to get, potentially we're going to get a the ridge of high pressure that has brought record temperatures to the Southwest is going to um, shift to the East. And so I think instead of equal chances in the middle of the Corn Belt, I think there, right now there's probably a better chance for above average temperatures, at least in the, in the last couple of days of, of July and the beginning of August, uh, there's probably a better chance for above normal temperatures in the, uh, in the Corn Belt than, uh, than that map reflects. And, you can see that, again, while a lot of the Corn Belt is, is still considered to be in a drought, the rainfall over the past month almost um, has helped improve soil moisture levels across some key growing areas. So in Iowa and in Wisconsin, those improvements will make a significant difference to yields there and, and may have provided enough soil moisture so that even if it even if it does turn hot and dry, as long as that period is relatively short, there's probably enough soil moisture in some of those areas to get the crop through that and, and potentially out the other side when it and if it does start raining again. Um, however, if you look at Minnesota, and Minnesota is a, a very large soybean producing state, um, and especially kind of in some of the areas there that are relatively dry, uh, Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, and uh, Southern Illinois, Missouri, all of those areas will need to get timely rainfall and, and potentially more rainfall than is forecast in the next two weeks. Otherwise, potentially you could start to eat into yields in those areas. And if you start cutting yields in, in Southern Illinois and in Minnesota and then, and then North Dakota and South Dakota, it will have a, a significant impact on the national yield. Um, I think Minnesota is, is probably the, it's, I think it's probably in the top five producing states. So it's, it's an important state. Um, and while Iowa and Nebraska are obviously two of the biggest producing states and, and soil moisture levels have improved there, um, if you kind of start to tick down yields it on some of the edges of the, the key producing areas, uh, it becomes a situation where it just gets harder and harder to, to reach the national average or for the national average to reach the trend line. Um, the way that I think about it is always, it's a little bit different than, than this issue, but like if you want to produce a, a record yield, you need good yields in Iowa and Illinois, of course, 
uh, but you also need good yields or record yields in the in the areas that are significant producers, but not the states that necessarily come to mind when you think about sort of a field of, of soybeans. And so I think that effect works here too. If, if you wanna to get to trend line, it's great to have Iowa and Nebraska at, at trend line or maybe a little bit above, but if you don't get uh, Minnesota and North Dakota and South Dakota at trend line, then it starts to become very, very difficult to get the national yield up to trend line for those other states to produce enough to offset whatever the reductions are in kind of the, the minor producing states. All right, let's start to talk a little bit about biofuel and our expectations for the EMTS data. Um, this chart is shows our expectations for the expansion in renewable diesel production capacity at various times. And I show this chart because uh, over the last couple of years, basically we had great expectations that, uh, that capacity was gonna grow really quickly um, that weren't quite met. And over the winter, this last winter, if you look at the January 23, the blue line, expectations for the growth in capacity fell to their lowest level. And then since then, and particularly over the last couple of months, you've seen expectations creep back up to the point where we are now basically in line with uh, the June 22 forecast, which was the highest uh, capacity that we ever expected and, and one of the fastest developing capacities that we've ever expected. Uh, and that has also kind of coincided with the movement that we've seen in prices. And so while I still think soybeans are the, are the prime driver for day-to-day -day movements in, in soybean oil right now, this, this kind of shows you the, the background theme, I guess, and, and maybe not quite so background, but sort of one of the underlying drive long-term trend drivers. And so... I think that there were several reasons for the weakness in, in prices over the, the winter and the spring, including some addition, some excess inventory that sort of had to be worked through. This idea that, uh, that renewable diesel capacity wasn't going to get built out as quickly as we had anticipated. Um, and now that is, is starting to reverse, at least the, the renewable diesel capacity part of it is, is starting to uh, reverse. And so we expect now, uh, based on the dark blue line, the January 23, or I'm sorry, the, the July 23 line, we expect that capacity will grow relatively close to where we thought it would be a, about a year ago at this time. And prices have have responded in part to that, I think in part to the concerns about the crop. Um, and I think maybe the selling was a little bit overdone. Um, and that's going to have a, a significant impact on, on margins as we'll, we'll go through here in a minute. Uh, the one thing that I would note, just as it shows on the slide, we expect that about 950 million gallons of additional capacity will come online before the end of, of 2023. However, there is some of that capacity that, um, that could slip into 2024. And so we might not quite get to 950 million. I think the last time I showed this slide, I think it said that we expected about 875 million gallons before the end of, of 2023. And that was, I think it was in June that I did that. Um, and so in the past month, we've increased our, our expectation for how much additional capacity would be added by about 75 million gallons. And of course, that additional capacity then contributes to this idea that we've talked a lot about, which is that because of the growth in capacity, and because of the margins in biodiesel production, we probably were going to overproduce relative to the amount that was required by the, the mandates. And you can see that's not uncommon. We've done it uh, 
in the past 10 years, we've done it most of the time. And so the last three years have been a bit unusual where we think that we didn't quite hit the number that was implied by the, the mandates. And this year, we think that we'll overproduce by about 1.16 or 1.2 billion gallons. That said, uh, there are, uh, there's an assumption in our renewable diesel production forecast that I'll talk about that kind of shows up in December. And, it, you know, the, the historical seasonal tendency was less production in January and then more production in, in December. And we still have that shape, except that the anticipated production based on our forecast right now is, is maybe a little bit strong in December. So, the 1.2 billion gallons is something that I think potentially could happen based on the data that we've seen so far, the monthly data from the EMTS, our expectations for renewable diesel production capacity growth, and then most importantly, our expectation for margins. However, the expectations for margins may be the limiting factor here because we've seen margins deteriorate pretty quickly and we'll kind of go through some of those here before we're finished, but it could be that the, the reduction in margin, the reduction in profitability that we've seen over the last month or so could have the effect of slowing the expansion of renewable diesel capacity down. And it also potentially could have the effect of starting to rationalize biodiesel capacity. Now, I've come on here a, a lot and said that I think rationalizing biodiesel capacity is gonna be really, really hard. That hasn't changed. The one thing that I kind of always said was that if you're going to rationalize the biodiesel capacity, one of the things that you're gonna to need to do is, is not only take biodiesel margins negative, but really negative because most producers went through the uh, margin decline due to COVID. And, and survive that. Now, that was obviously a sort of a one-off that was going to end at, at some point. The current decline is one that doesn't necessarily have that potential endpoint out there someplace. And so margins have gotten, our estimate of, of biodiesel margins have gotten pretty negative. And then the question becomes, will they, they probably are negative enough now that if you expected that to be the equilibrium going forward and you owned a biodiesel plant, you might start to consider shutting down your plant or doing something different with your plant. However, it's that will negative margins continue for a lot longer part that's really required, I think, to get biodiesel producers to start rationalizing. And based on some of the consulting requests I've gotten recently, I'm not 100% sure that that's necessarily the way biodiesel producers are, are thinking about what is happening right now. And so again, I think that there will be, if this continues and it looks like it's gonna continue for a while, I think we'll start to get some rationalization of, of biodiesel capacity. Um, however, I think that, of course, some of it, like the integrated producers, the crushers that also have a, a biodiesel plant, those guys aren't going anywhere. Uh, and so it probably will occur in, in some small biodiesel producers that don't have a real uh, advantage in feedstock sourcing or geography, market, or something else that can help them sort of carry through this period of, of negative margins to potentially the other side when margins start to come back. So I say all that to say that while we're at 1.2 billion gallons right now, and that all seems to fit and kind of work based on what we've seen so far this year, the second half of the year could have a lot more uncertainty than the first half of the year did. And that's primarily due to what we've seen happen in margins here over the past month or so.
Uh, a big chunk of, of that additional production is due to the gap between our expectation for ethanol supply and ethanol demand. You can see the, um, the implied ethanol mandate is, is going to decrease in 2024 and 2025 from its 15.25 billion gallon level in 2023. That is going to cut the amount of additional biomass-based diesel that's needed to meet the total mandate. Um, the 2023 hasn't really, the, our expectation for 2023 hasn't really changed since the last time we got EMTS data. And it implies about 555 million gallons of additional biomass-based diesel production. So roughly half of that 1.2 billion gallon over production could go away if, ethanol uh, production just meets expectation or meets the uh, meets the mandate or the mandated volumes. And again, we talk about the mandated volumes as if those are the actual numbers. Remember, those aren't necessarily the numbers. The, if you're an individual obligated party, you don't get a notice from the EPA that says you must blend a billion gallons. You get a notice from the EPA that says you must blend 10% of the fuel that you uh, sell with biodiesel or renewable diesel, something like that. So it, it can vary, the, the mandate can vary a little bit based on actual consumption versus, versus predicted consumption. That said, I don't think that it's gonna, it's going to, I don't think that consumption is gonna reduce the mandate by a billion gallons. So while the 555 could theoretically go away, it doesn't seem likely that all of it will go away. And, and maybe it will be 400 million or 350 million instead of 555, but it seems very unlikely that that will go back to zero, that the 1.03 billion gallons will drop to zero or, um, or that will overproduce ethanol relative to what the mandates would imply. All right, so for uh, June, we are expecting the EPA to report that bio or biodiesel production dropped a little bit to about 150 million gallons uh, from 163 last year. If you look at the year over year comparison, that would be a, a slight increase, about a 7 million gallon increase from last year. Uh, and renewable diesel production to rise to 237 million gallons from 229 last month and from 106 last year. So more than double what we saw uh, last year, sorry, 116 last year. Um, the, the question is, and I think what we've, we've reduced our biodiesel production a little bit based on what we're seeing happen with uh, with margins. And then the question will become, or, or I guess what the report will tell us is how much that decline in margins really had an impact on production right now. My guess is probably not that much. And so we haven't cut biodiesel production more. Um, however, if the negative margins rolled into August and then September, then I think you probably will start to see more of a, a decrease in biomass-based diesel or biodiesel production than, than we're showing. And we may ultimately need to cut our biodiesel forecast. But I think the EMTS data on Thursday will provide a good first data point that will give us some indication of biodiesel producers' reaction to the to the decline in margins and potentially maybe even what we can expect going forward if we expect margins to remain under pressure, which it seems likely that they, they could. The last thing I wanna say about the slide before I go to the next one is you can see here where in December, we've got renewable diesel production at 352 million gallons. Now, again, a lot of the, the reason that, that increases there is because we set an annual number and then we kind of, we, we change our monthly numbers to sort of fit what we think makes sense for any given month. 
and then whatever the difference is between the first 11 months and our annual forecast ends up being the December forecast. So the 352 million is is a is a result of our other assumptions and not necessarily an assumption about what we really think is going to happen in December. And it seems a little high, honestly, based on the, the changes that we made when the final mandates came out and some of the other changes that we've made. It, it, we wanted to get through this report before we really started to uh, started to cut from the volumes that the final mandates implied for 2023. So after we get the data on Thursday, then we'll adjust. It wouldn't surprise me if that 352 million shrank a bit. Now, there is some potential that um, that if biodiesel margins stay under pressure and, and, and negative, that falling biodiesel production will offset some of the need to reduce renewable diesel production. So I don't know that I think that it will fall enough that we get, like if it fell 90 million gallons, essentially you would be the, the top of the December bar would be about in line with the bar for November and the other bars. I don't think we're gonna get that much of a reduction no matter what margins do between now and, and December but we could get a little bit on the margin and it would it, the most likely outcome is a is it probably a modest reduction in biodiesel and a modest reduction in renewable diesel production expectations for december however again we'll know a lot more after we get this report and after another little bit of of kind of seeing what we think margins are going to do uh, this is just kind of that chart in a little bit more uh, in a little bit more detail or a little bit focused in on on uh, what biodiesel production itself is going to be. You can see that uh, the biodiesel production kind of in in May was as high as it's been in quite a while. Uh, and since it looks like December 2021. Um, and that was when, margins were starting to decline. Now, they were still uh, positive, but they and they were 66 cents a gallon, which is actually a, a really good margin for any any refiner. Um, but it's biodiesel is less than renewable diesel, but it's still a relatively decent margin. And so our our average for June was about seven cents that's a fairly significant decline but at seven cents it's it's basically back around the long-term historical average if you just kind of look at the uh the chart and see where marge what where margin sort of wobbled around before they really exploded over the last couple of years seven cents was probably in that ballpark and so the impact on production in, in June may not be that great. However, by the end of the month, um, margins were down to, they were negative. And as you can see, in by mid-July, there were 65 cents a gallon uh, loss, basically, for producing biodiesel using soybean oil primarily as a feedstock. I, I should say that part, too. Again, our our Profitability estimates in the California market assume a biodiesel feedstock mix that is 75% soybean oil, 25% yellow grease, and our renewable diesel feedstock mix is um, is 50% tallow, 25% distiller's corn oil, and then 25% yuco. And so while we talk about it as biodiesel margins and renewable diesel margins. Another way to think about it is margins using vegetable oil and margins using fats and greases. And the margins using vegetable oil have, have fallen, not necessarily more, but have fallen to the point where if you're producing biodiesel or renewable diesel, 
um, your margins have come down quite a bit. Now, fats and greases have fallen too. Uh, the fat and grease feedstock prices have, have also rallied. And so renewable diesel margins have also been under pretty significant pressure, but they remain um, positive by more than a dollar, uh, almost a dollar fifty a gallon, I think, and we'll see it here in a minute or two. Um, on imports, we expect imports to remain strong. Uh, imports have been something of a, a a little bit of a surprise to me. So if if you look at the last couple of years, basically, if if you took the five year average, um, that would that would be a good estimate for what imports would be in any given month and for the year. Uh, in this year, we've seen imports that, are, have, that have been double or triple the five-year average so far. And I don't know if it is that biodiesel exporters are trying to ship as much into the US while they still get the blenders tax credit before the switch to the Inflation Reduction Act credits, which effectively will not pay for imports or you don't get uh, the credit if you are importing the fuel. And so are they just trying to chip in as much as they can before they know that they lose that? Or is there something else that is is driving this? My my guess is that they are. It's it maybe a little bit of of both. So they know that the Inflation Reduction Act is coming, and so anything that they can sell into the U.S. is is a good thing right now before the expiration of the blender's tax credit. And it also may be that um, that because margins have been positive and in historically high that that has helped attract biodiesel imports now that said margins were also high in in 2022 and we didn't get a big surge in in biodiesel imports and so i think that part of this almost has to be this idea that there's only so much time where imports into the u.s will work and so companies outside of the u.s that can produce biodiesel that meets the EPA uh, requirements are going to try and chip as much in as they can. And, and our forecast kind of reflects that. And it remains above the five-year average, even in December, where, you, where the five-year average line doesn't extend to. Um, but it's, it's above that five-year average through there. And it will be a little surprising to me if, if imports fall, um, even with margins where they are. Now, it, it may be that margins have a much bigger impact on imports than they do on on domestic production just because if you produce a gallon and you're going to export it someplace you can ship it to the us or you can ship it to europe and if you're going to produce it domestically you have a, a plant and everything and so you're going to run that and uh, maybe you run it not quite as hard but it's not like you in theoretically i guess you could ship the output from your plant to europe or someplace but my point is that there's just more flexibility for exporters than there are for domestic producers. And so I would expect that, uh, that imports will remain above uh, the five-year average, again, going through the end of the year. For renewable diesel, um, so there the, uh, you can see that in June, our estimated average for renewable diesel profitability or for profitability of biofuel from or biomass based diesel from fat, using fats and greases as a feedstock was about a dollar 65 uh, and that was down a bit from the prior month not as much as as uh, biomass based diesel or biodiesel or, or producing biomass based diesel from vegetable oil, but it still is getting down in, into sort of the lower end of, of the recent range and, and maybe below that. Um, and again, this month's data will, will help provide a little bit of insight into the reaction of domestic producers to the change in, in margins, although 
the production in, in June will have been booked, the feedstock will have been booked before that, the, uh, the sale of the product will probably have been booked before that as well. So the economics of, of June won't necessarily be felt until we get a little bit, um, a month or two down the road. And then that will in turn also depend a little bit on where margins are at that point. No matter what, it seems like 352 million gallons in December may be a bit of an aspirational goal. Uh, and probably that's going to come down by 50 million gallons, at least, uh, I would suspect, when we get the EMTS data. Now, if, if June comes in at, at 300 million gallons, then I think we probably aren't going to, in part because we'll have 70 or 60 more million gallons produced in June than we expected, so that will go long, that will be closer to meeting the annual total, and that would just naturally reduce uh, December. But ultimately, I think that that number, again, probably is, is going to need to come down a bit. All right, so what does that mean for capacity utilization? And you can see that capacity utilization is kind of settled into this, this lower range. So from 2019 to basically mid 2022 capacity utilization seemed to go between about 80% and 100% uh, or a little bit more than 100%. And we can have over 100% because we are comparing the EPA's production with the EIA's capacity. So uh, the timing of the EPA production can be a little bit different than the timing of the EIA's estimate of productive capacity. And so there can be the odd month there where we're over 100. And historically, that has happened a couple of times. Now, though, we've seen, you know, since late 2022, we've seen significant growth in capacity and, and not quite the same amount of growth in, in production. And so capacity utilization has been around 50, maybe a little bit above 50 percent. Uh, or uh, sorry, it hasn't quite broken 50%, I don't think, since, uh, since what is that, probably November of 2022. Um, and we expect that it's going to kind of stay in this range, go up a little bit, and then as, as we get more expansion, renewable diesel capacity, uh, particularly in the, in the fourth quarter of 2023, then that growth combined with our expectations for production reduces it a little bit so that the average through the end of the year is, is just below uh, um, 56 or it's right around 56 percent. Um, however, there's a big pop up because of 352 million gallons in in December. And if we take December out of that, then the average is about 53 percent. Um, I still believe that in, in a lot of our a lot of our assumptions are based on the idea that renewable diesel facilities are going to run at capacity utilization rates that are much closer to the average that we saw from 2019 to 2022 to mid 2022 than over the last six months or eight months or whatever. It's it's something that just doesn't make intuitive sense to me that renewable diesel producers would operate at 50% at capacity. Now, there's some part of this that is, as you're adding a lot of capacity, when you start a facility up, you don't use all of that capacity on the first day, no matter what. And so there's, there's a little bit of that. And given how fast we expect the capacity to grow through the end of the year, that certainly is 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 keeping pressure on capacity utilization rates but i still do firmly believe that once that capacity is built and they they've gone through the ramp up period that they're going to run that plant as close to full capacity as as they can assuming that margins remain positive which for renewable diesel looks like they should remain positive 
so it it's something that if I just was if I if I started as an analyst today and I didn't have any of this history and somebody said okay here's the data um, for renewable diesel capacity and where do you think production is going to be I would essentially take 85 percent of, of whatever that renewable diesel capacity number was for any given month and kind of say okay I think it's probably going to be around here and I I would feel relatively confident in that guess. But given that we do have the, the recent history in the, in the data, it makes it difficult to put capacity where it should be just intuitively to me. So we'll see if capacity utilization rates keep growing. And um, this is something that we will probably talk more about in, in the future. I, I don't think that this is going to go away. I do think that it'll be it'll be interesting as the expansion starts to slow down to see if capacity continues to um, to rise. The other thing that I'll say is that uh, we've got better EIA data than we've had in the past. and. So one of the things that I'm going to do in the future is you'll see this as EIA production compared to EIA capacity, and that'll help with some of the timing issues. And it does, it, if you look at it that way, it also does boost up the, um, the capacity utilization rates, but still not to the level that, that you would expect kind of intuitively just based on how much would I run a renewable diesel facility if I owned one. So it's, it's better, but it's not, it still is below the, the run rates that you would expect. And in, we're there because it's, it's been, that's where we've been recently. So as an analyst, it's, it's hard to predict, uh, it's hard to predict significant changes, even in a case like this where Everything that you've ever learned your whole life would tell you that uh, the capacity utilization rates should be higher than they are right now. But in the future, we'll look at this EIA and EIA, and that'll help clear up a little bit of it. Uh, so renewable diesel imports, and when you can see we're coming up to the time of the year when renewable diesel exporters typically start to do a little bit of maintenance. And so you typically get a drop off in, in July, uh, in some reductions in June. And then in the fall, you start to see production ramp up again. And we don't expect anything different this year. Um, it, like biodiesel and, and everything else, I think this month will be kind of interesting just from a how do renewable diesel imports react to the to the decline in margins, and then how um, how will what do we expect them to do going forward based on our expectation for uh, for margins going forward? And renewable diesel producers can have the same flexibility that or renewable diesel exporters have the same flexibility that biodiesel exporters have, and so. Ultimately, if, if margins continue to come down, I would expect imports of both to, uh, to start to drop off. Um, but again, that may be tempered a little bit by the idea that there's only so much time left for, uh, for exporters to capture the Bunders tax credit. And so maybe the idea is that uh, if you're looking at that as kind of a, a bonus dollar, um, that you'll take a little bit lower margins just to capture that dollar while you still can. All right, so that is our expectations for production. And what does that translate into in terms of feedstock demand? So you can see the three largest, basically, uh, feedstocks, yellow grease, cooking oil, soybean oil, and then... Um, Canola oil, um, tallow is is uh, tallow and distillers corn oil are are close anyway. Uh, we've got soybean oil going up to one point two billion pounds essentially in May when the EIA releases that data at the end of of this month. That may be a, a little bit optimistic 
but just based on where we've been the last couple of months, um, if we get a, an increase in, in biodiesel and renewable diesel production month over month, it wouldn't surprise me a little bit if, if some of that increase was uh, also increased the portion of, of soybean oil that's used. That said, I think that, um, and, and I say that because in, in part, uh, there was a time when I think fats and grease prices probably held up a little bit better and started to move a little bit more than, uh, than soybean oil. It was really relatively short period of time, and I think soybean oil has kind of caught up and, and gone beyond that now. Um, but it may be that, that soybean oil is a little bit stronger this month than it has been, or in, in May than it has been the last couple of months. Um, and we have going forward, we kind of have it based on the, uh, we have it remaining close to that level based on our assumption about the feedstock mix going forward. Uh, the, the price movement that we've seen in soybean oil and in the other commodities too, but the price movement that we've seen in soybean oil recently is, is the real driving factor behind the negative biodiesel margins so while in, in May, it may be that our forecast isn't too, too optimistic, it might probably still be a little bit optimistic. Uh, going forward in, in July and August and September, uh, we might ultimately cut those down a little bit and reallocate some of that to one of the low CI feedstocks or to canola oil, given the uh, differential between soybean oil, given that the differential between soybean oil and canola oil is, is relatively narrow or historically narrow. Um, it wouldn't surprise me a lot to see a, a little bit of a shift out of, out of soybean oil uh, to some other things. Um, but if we do continue to get the growth in, in renewable diesel production capacity that we see, ultimately there's going to need to be enough feedstock and that's going to force, uh, not necessarily force, but that's going to increase the volume of, of all the feedstocks that we use. And ultimately the vegetable oils will, will increase a little bit more because the feedstock or the, the low CI feedstocks, the supply is, is sort of fixed and we will be kind of basically out of, of those feedstocks. I don't think that that's a, a 2023 thing necessarily, um, but that day is, is going to come. And I think that it, it may be, depending on where we end up in, with renewable diesel capacity at the end of 2023, and more importantly, what is going on with biodiesel capacity, it may be that in 2024, we start to, to bump up against that where the amount of available low CI feedstocks is, is kind of exhausted, basically. Um, not that we're going to, that the, that renewable or biomass-based diesel production is going to take all of the low CI feedstocks, um, but given the strength that we've seen in their domestic non-biofuel demand, that if you assume that that demand doesn't go away, and you continue to grow the feedstock demand, then at some point there just isn't any more supply of, of low CI feedstocks to grow the um, to grow biomass-based diesel production. Yuko is it, Yuko slash yellow grease is is the one sort of exception to the low CI uh, supply cap, and. I still do believe that there's a significant, there could be significant growth in, in UCO production and consumption in at least parts of, of the US. And, and so as you aggregate those up broadly in the US, but not necessarily in every market in the US is I guess the best way to say that. Whether, whether prices for the other low CI feedstocks and soybean oil are gonna rise enough that we start to tap into some of the UCO that isn't necessarily being collected or that maybe more accurately 
is collected but doesn't necessarily meet, meet spec and would need a little bit more work to get to spec than uh, than some of the other feedstocks. Whether by the end of the year we're at that point where we're starting to draw in more UCO supply because of that, uh, I think is going to be a key thing to know and understand before we get to 2024, because I do think that that, and I think in 2024, we're going to start to get, um, or we're going to start to hit that limit on low CI feedstocks. And then theoretically, that's when you would start to tap in and start to bring back some of the UCO that's not necessarily finding its way into the feedstock supply at, at this point. Uh, and this just shows our expectation for soybean oil as a percent of total feedstocks. You can see it it been below the five year average for all of the year so far, uh, and for most of the last two years, we're expecting that it will rise up by the end of the year to about fifty percent or a little bit more than fifty percent of the total feedstocks used. That is a, a shade of that is this idea that the low CI feedstock supply is is ultimately or the available supply is ultimately going to kind of run out. Um, but that's just kind of the beginning of that. And so it it. It could be that in October, November, December, we're a little bit below the level that we expect, but we wouldn't necessarily expect that as you extend this into 2024, that we're going to stay at the lower end of, of the historical range. Ultimately, we think that this is probably going to get back up to the five-year average and then above the five-year average. If it doesn't happen in the fourth quarter of 2023, I think it probably will happen potentially depending on the US crop and the competing uh, feedstock production, particularly canola oil. Uh, whether that will happen in, in 2024 or not. If we get the continued growth in renewable diesel production, or production capacity and we don't get any decrease in biodiesel production capacity, then it seems really likely that it will happen in, in 2024. Um, if we reduce biodiesel production capacity, then potentially it, it may not quite get up to uh, up above 50% or above the five year average in the first part of 2024. But I would I would say by the end of 2024, I will be really, really surprised if soybean oil isn't 50% of the of the feedstock mix. All right, finally on to margins. And I apologize that we have not updated our forecasts in a bit. My Computer problems are, I'm tired of making the excuse, but they are preventing us from doing some of the things that we need to do to update our forecast. I am going to do everything that I can to get that fixed this week so that we can actually post a report and update our forecast. In the meantime, here is a little bit different look at, um, at our biofuel profitability estimates. So this basically separates them all and assumes that you produce 100% of, or you produce renewable diesel using 100% um, UCO or soybean oil or poultry fat or whatever the line is. And you can see generally that, uh, that margins have come down over the last several months. And for some, they've come down and they've, they've started to rebound. Uh, but most are significantly lower than they were a couple months ago. And again, that sort of reflects the, um, the broader trend that shows up in our estimates for California. Now, these are all California as well, but we've got the feedstock mix over there. The, the note here that shows that, you know, soybean oil prices have, have jumped almost 10 cents um is one of the things that has really sort of weighed on on profitability uh the if you see the the gray line there in that period where it, it's jumped you go down from uh, a little bit more than a dollar to briefly negative there um before rebounding a little bit and so that is the pressure that is on a lot of, uh, on certainly on our estimate for biodiesel. Uh, going forward, uh, a lot of that 
our expectations are going to depend a lot on what happens with the weather, obviously, and the U.S. soybean crop. Um, but it will also depend a lot on whether we think that the current margins are going to extend, are going to last for a period that's long enough that it actually does start to rationalize some biodiesel capacity. And so if we look at, at biodiesel margins based on, um, based on individual feedstocks for the California market, uh, you can see soybean oil and canola oil and uh, distiller's corn oil all deeply negative, not quite as bad as the part that's hidden by the, um, by the legend, uh, but certainly headed in that direction. And that is something that if I owned a biodiesel plant would concern me. Now, again, I think that it's, there's some, you can generalize a little bit, uh, but there's some significant differences between the California market and other markets beyond sort of the LCFS and the LCFS credits. The LCFS credits obviously help to offset some of the decline in profitability. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, that we're going to see, I, I imagine, I haven't looked at this specifically, I imagine biodiesel margins are, if you're using soybean oil, are probably negative in every region that we, we report biodiesel prices for. Um, and so I, I don't mean to say that you can't generalize from the California market to broader to what's going on more broadly in in the US. However, I do think that there can be specific instances where um, where this profitability estimate doesn't necessarily reflect what's going on for an individual company or a, a region. Um, and certainly the idea that you're just going to use only soybean oil to produce biodiesel while it's more common in biodiesel plants, I think it's probably becoming a little bit less common. And so there also is probably a mix of, of different feedstocks. Okay, all of, all of that said, uh, biodiesel margins have come down a lot. And it's something that I think I have been really surprised at the strength of biodiesel margins through much of last year and, and through the first part of this year. Of course, the energy prices help that out quite a bit, um, but it still just surprised me that we were kind of a year into the big expansion of renewable diesel production capacity and biodiesel margins were still historically high. That was always kind of a little unusual to me. And now that's starting to, um, I think we're starting to go back to where equilibrium really is, which, again, is probably profitable, but just not quite as profitable as we've been the last, uh, the last couple of years, but also probably not quite as, as negative as we are now. I think what our, our forecast will show for the next year is that it's probably going to be a relatively tough year for, for biodiesel producers, for a lot of biodiesel producers, especially those that are using vegetable oil as the primary component of their feedstock mix. But, and I think our forecast for the next year probably will show that, um, that biodiesel margins remain under pressure, uh, maybe not quite at the level that we're at right now, or maybe a, a little bit of time where we're at this level and then they start to improve as, as we get closer to the end of the year. But it could be that, that we finally are hitting that point that I think it seemed like it was much more likely to happen than not, which is that margin that the growth in renewable diesel production would pressure biodiesel margins, and then that would ultimately force some rationalization in, in biodiesel capacity. Um, and the industry seemed to defy logic for the last for the last year or so. Uh, and so I think this is really just working back to 
what the industry needs to look like to move forward over the next five years or 10 years. And I think part of that is uh, a reduction. And unfortunately for the people that own biodiesel and work in biodiesel plant, some, some biodiesel plants, um, I think unfortunately that's gonna mean that we probably are gonna produce less biodiesel in the US or have less production capacity uh, than we have had. All right, got a couple of questions. Thank you so much for those. Um, based on the drought risk and the RD capacity catching up, is your June 13th soybean oil price forecast, which was bearish, still valid? Um, it's going to be, it, it, in, the, in the short term, it's going to be more bullish. In the longer term, it's still valid. And, and by longer term, I mean, if we get to the, uh, if we get to planting of the South American crop, that's the next time that I think that you really have the potential to take soybean, soybean oil and soybean meal prices down and, and other vegetable oil prices down as well. Um, I think that, what we saw before the concerns about the U.S. crop started to develop again was the market starting to price in a U.S. crop that um, that was big enough to meet all of the domestic needs and um, but not necessarily big enough to export as much as we have uh, have traditionally. But that was okay because Brazil seems like in, in South America seems like they are going to produce a lot more soybeans next year than they did last year. And, uh, and they will have exportable supplies that will limit the need for, um, for US exports. So in the short term, this weather risk is going to get priced in. And then depending on what happens with the weather over the next couple of weeks, and then after that for a month, um, that will still drive prices in the short term. And, and right now that looks more bullish than it has recently. So in the short term, I think you can, uh, I think the forecast will be higher and hopefully I'm gonna get this posted uh, today or tomorrow at the very latest. So you can actually see what I'm talking about. Um, the forecast will be a little bit higher over the next month or two and then, well, over the next through September, October. And then depending on where we are then with the US crop, let's just say that the US crop makes trend line. If the US crop makes trend line, then I would assume the trend line yield, then I would assume that, um, that the soybean oil price would, and soybean complex prices, I guess is what I should say, soybean complex prices will start to decline in September, October, and then as the South American crop gets planted, I think prices will just kind of continue to decline. And that's one of the things, when I talk about the biodiesel margins and, and coming under pressure and, and whether they will really, whether the industry will really start to rationalize capacity or not, the part of it, the, the, the fundamental backdrop that makes me think that this won't necessarily lead to a significant reduction in biodiesel production capacity is that fact. The fact that if we get to December and the U.S. crop is, is pretty much anything other than a disaster, then uh, I think the market is going to price in a huge South American crop and that'll take soybean oil prices down. That should theoretically improve biodiesel margins. And so if I own, if I owned a biodiesel facility, that's what I would be looking for is where are we going to be in October, November, December? And if margins still look bad at that point, then I would start to, uh, think about what I wanted to do with my plant, whether I wanted to keep it open or whether I wanted to uh, do something else. 
Um, why isn't more biodiesel imported into the US? What are the most prominent sources of imports? Um, so our neighbors, Canada, and uh, to a little bit lesser degree, Europe uh, are the most prominent sources. Um, and we don't import more because, well, in part we sued Argentina uh, to get them to stop importing the, or exporting to us. They used to be our biggest supplier outside of the US. Um, and so, but the, but, for several reasons, including the tax structure, the export tax structure in Argentina, uh, the U.S. government claimed that Argentina, the Argentine industry was dumping biodiesel in the U.S. and the courts agreed, and so they put really high tariffs on on Argentine biodiesel, and so they don't really sell to us anymore. They sell mostly to Europe. Uh, so I think that that is a, it's a stark example of, of you want to be able to import or you want to be able to export into the US market to capture the, the credits, the valuable credits that under the uh, RFS and under the LCFS programs, but you don't want to do too much of that because if you do, then the U.S. government will start to look at you and and wonder if you are dumping and and whether you're hurting the domestic industry. They obviously are um, are very supportive of the domestic industry, and so they don't want it threatened by uh, by imports that may be less expensive than domestically produced fuel. Um, and while there's no, this, that's a little conspiracy theory or tin hatty, certainly, I, uh, if I was a biodiesel producer that wasn't in the U S I would certainly think about the Argentine case, uh, when I was deciding whether I wanted to just go wild and ship as much as I could to the U S or not. Um, I think that you will see biodiesel imports decline generally over the next five years, 10 years. There's the obvious decline from the switch from the Blenders tax credit to the Inflation Reduction Act credit and the loss of that dollar. But even beyond that, as you start to ramp up uh, or as you ramp up renewable diesel production capacity, and particularly if you don't, if you don't rationalize US domestic biodiesel production capacity, then you're going to have as much capacity as as you need, I guess. And um, and while there would always be room for for imports, I think that 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 growth is going to make it harder and harder to import into the U.S. beyond the um, the dollar hit that uh, exporters' margins are going to take once the blender's tax credit expires fully. So there isn't really any. It, on the face of it, I think it makes sense to say, well, if I produce biodiesel out in a country outside of the US, I would I would ship as much of it to the US as I could and get all of the credits that I could. Um, that makes 100% sense. However, again, there's the there's the Argentine case. And then the other part is that you have to meet EPA certification. It's not that's not the most difficult thing in, in the world to do, but it is another barrier to entering the market. Uh, and so there's not a, a huge big reason that I have sort of locked and loaded and ready to answer this question with, um, but there are several little reasons that all sort of combine to limit uh, the volume of uh, biodiesel that the US imports. Um, on renewable diesel, it's it's kind of the same uh, same situation. Uh, the only difference is that there are uh, the main suppliers are not uh, are not Canada and and Europe. They are Singapore um, and Singapore, I think. Um, have biodiesel margins been stronger than expected due to a better price? as in a lesser discount of stripped biodiesel to ultra low sulfur diesel. 
If so, what do you think drove this? So if I have these numbers, I'm sure of better price. So I think what you're asking here is, um, were margins stronger because the the value of biodiesel itself, the fuel, not necessarily the credits, um, was stronger than competing fuels, I guess is the best way to put that. And that certainly had an impact at, at the very least in the California market. So um, you may or may not remember, there was a slide I put up and I've, I've thought about putting it up again, but the slide shows the difference between renewable diesel prices in the California market and the stripped biodiesel price in the California market. So a gallon of renewable diesel versus a gallon of, of biodiesel, just the fuel. And um, the in the California market, historically, the renewable diesel traded at a premium, which makes 100% sense, given that it's a drop in fuel, you don't have cloud point issues, all of that stuff that we all know. And oddly enough, towards the end of last year, biodiesel started trading at a premium to renewable diesel. I think although this still doesn't make 100% sense to me, but this is the best answer that I could come up with. Um, the California market was obviously short biodiesel, I guess, because the price rose so much. Uh, and because we ship roughly, we ship like 85% of renewable diesel production into the California market, and we ship about 15% of biodiesel production, US biodiesel production into the California market. And so because of that, I, th I think that somehow the California market was short of, of biodiesel. Now, it's not like there are volumes associated with the LCFS program that need to be met in the same way that we have volumes for the RFS. Um, but um, there was something going on there. Now, it didn't last as long as the high bio or the historically high biodiesel margins. So I, I, I don't think that there is necessarily that sort of real correlation and causation. I think it, it happened to be that there was this, whatever happened in the California market happened to coincide with strength in margins broadly for biodiesel, renewable diesel in the California market outside of the California market, because energy prices had moved up so much because of all of the things that happened to drive energy prices higher. And so I think it was more a function of, of that, of the general strength in energy prices that was well beyond the, the strength that we saw in, in feedstock prices and then left margins at, at that level. Um, that's a good question though, and, and happy to talk about that more if, if you would like. Uh, can I talk to the... Uh, U.S. soybean oil balance sheet for 2324 Jacobson versus the USDA. I can, and what I would suggest, and I'll, I'll talk about it really briefly here because I'm almost up on an hour, uh, but also I'm happy to, if you want to send me an email, I'm happy to meet and answer questions that you have about it and talk a little bit about it uh, in just the uh, two of us or, or anyway, uh, the main difference between us and USDA is, is really comes down to um, the split between biofuel demand and, and non-biofuel demand. We know that historically our model tends to overpredict feedstock demand. So we have a number that's up there. We understand it's probably going to come down However, I think that USDA may be a little bit low on their, on their forecast for soybean oil used in, bi in biodiesel production or biomass-based diesel production. The reason that I think they do it and the, and the reason that I, that I, well, another difference is our, our domestic non-biofuel demand. The reason that I think USDA's biofuel forecast or feedstock demand forecast for soybean oil is where it is, is in part because of where its domestic non-biofuel forecast is. Uh, 
And so in 2324, you really are at a spot where it looks like you're either going to need, you're going to need to limit the, the use of, of one of those. We, I have predicted lower non-biofuel use for a couple of years in a row now, and it's, it's never happened. And as I mentioned earlier, if you look at the low CI feedstocks, we don't really see a slowdown in domestic non-biofuel demand there either. So I think that domestic non-biofuel probably also ends up a little bit above where we are, but maybe below where USDA is. And the only reason that I say below where USDA is, is because I can't really figure out how else to solve the balance sheet without some combination of, of a reduction from where our biofuel feedstock is, the forecast is, and a reduction from where USDA's non-biofuel feedstock demand is set. Um, so that, that's the primary difference. I think exports are going to continue to be 300 million pounds. Um, imports, I don't think, are going to take off. I've, I've sort of given up on that idea. I think we might get a, a small increase. So maybe we go from 350 to 400 million pounds or 400 to 450, something like that. Um, one of the keys will, will certainly be production and, and soybean oil yield. Uh, production obviously will be a function of what the the U.S. how big the U.S. crop is, um, and what our crushing capacity is. There is a significant expansion expected in in crushing capacity, and then maybe more importantly, refining capacity um, in this fall, this summer, and this fall. And so it will be interesting to see where exactly we end up in within crushing capacity. Our forecast for crush, which is 2.3, almost 2.4 billion bushels, is mainly driven by that crushing capacity. And so if crushing capacity doesn't expand as much as we expect, then that could limit production a little bit, which would then make that question about how do we allocate the supply that's there between feedstock demand and non-feedstock demand or non-biofuel demand that much more difficult to, um, to solve. I hope that was helpful, but again, I'm happy to discuss that in a little bit more detail if you will send me an email that I will try and respond to. All right, everybody, thank you so much for, uh, for coming this week. I'm sorry we ran longer than we, than we typically run. Uh, I look forward to seeing everybody next week, and I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. All right, see everybody later. Bye-bye.